first off, thanks for coming on here, Marianne. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course. So I usually start these things off by having the guests give a little bit about themselves and their work, but I reckon anyone tuning into this will already know you and what you're about. So in the interest of everyone's time, I figured we can get right into this and dive right into your new book. Thank the you. The Mystic Jesus and the Mind Thank of Love. You. Does that sound all right? Sounds good. Awesome. So yeah, how exactly would you describe what that book is all about and where did it all come from for you to write it? Well, I have been involved in um, the study of a set of books called The Course in Miracles for decades. And The Course in Miracles is not a religion. It is a psychological mind training, self-study program of spiritual psychotherapy um, based on universal spiritual themes. There's no dogma, there's no doctrine, and it uses Christ-centered language, but using these terms in psychotherapeutic oriented ways. So you don't have to be a Christian. In fact, some people who uh, do uh, follow traditional Christian doctrine or dogma might be the first to say, no, this isn't for me. But I have found as someone who has spoken within these circles of comparative religion and spiritual traditions, this almost aversion to talking about Jesus because he's like locked into a cage Mm -hmm. of interpretation forged by the traditional ecclesiastical Christian church. And I think that that's unfortunate because I think we're living at a time of spiritual evolution and revolution at this time. Mm -hmm. And I think that a new look at Jesus is part of that, just like a new look at Buddha, a new look at Muhammad, a new look at uh, all of the great religious and spiritual traditions, along with a new look at politics, a new look at economics, a new look at society. We're just living in this time. And Jesus shouldn't be left out of this larger evolutionary um, rethinking of the world. And that's what fascinates me. Because as a non-Christian, when I look at these terms from the context of A Course in Miracles, I see Jesus as a spiritual force a universal spiritual force that cannot be monopolized or caged within any, within any one uh, religious doctrine. And when he is looked that way, at that way, he is a force that represents the full actualization of the divine potential of humanity. And what I mean by that is the potential within us to become completely, unconditionally loving species. And I think that people are open now in a way that has not been true, perhaps ever, to the idea that that evolutionary goal and that potential is literally, at this point, the only survivable option for the human race. Mm -hmm. That our lack of love for each other, our lack of love for the earth, our lack of love for nature, for animals, for our great-grandchildren is literally, at this point, represents a suicidal march yeah. uh, for the human race. Yeah, very well said. Yeah, that's um, you summed it up very well. I actually just finished reading your book probably about an hour ago, and I think that's a great summary of it. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So how would you describe the difference in seeing Jesus in this light as opposed to the traditional fundamental description of Jesus and who we thought Jesus was? You know, what is this new um, seeing and what is different in his message maybe? Well, first of all, there's nothing here to diminish, to minimize, or to show any disrespect uh, for traditional Christianity. And many people who are devout Christians find in the Course in Miracles and um, an expansion of their uh, of of their vision of Christ. But in answer to your question, where are there also differences? Let's put the two interpretations side by side. First of all, there is there was a historical Jesus. Obviously, traditional Christianity does uh, emphasize the historical Jesus who lived 2,000 years ago. The mystical Jesus, the mystical Christ, is the idea of a force of consciousness within all of us, which can be chosen at any given moment. 
that when we choose with love in any given moment, we are literally thinking with God. Hmm. We are literally doing God's work on earth. Um, the idea of the Holy Spirit is the idea of an aspect of consciousness within us, which when we are tempted away from God, i.e. away from love, into thoughts of attack and thoughts of judgment, thoughts of defense, all those loveless thoughts that dominate the world, there is an aspect of our own consciousness, which is a, a bridge back to loving perception when we choose. The idea of Jesus is the idea in the Course in Miracles of someone who lived on this earth, but thought, thoughts completely purified of any fear. And fear here is seen in relation to love, what darkness is in relation to light. Darkness isn't a thing. It's a, the absence of a thing. And when you turn on the light, the, love, the darkness is gone. Similarly, when you turn the, on, on the love, the mind of love, one name of which is Jesus, the darkness disappears. There is an alchemical process within us by which we move from the thought of anger, from the thought of control, from the thought of negativity, from the thought of selfishness, from the thought of reactivity. And it's, it's a psychological process, which is symbolized, by the way, by those three days between the crucifixion and the resurrection. The crucifixion, the metaphysical or psychological meaning of crucifixion, is what fear-based thinking does to us. Moving us constantly into defensiveness and anger and reactivity and all the things that dominate this world. They dominate foreign affairs. They dominate, they dominate our personal relationships. They dominate social media. And it's a loveless perception of ourselves, of each other, of the planet. And, and everybody knows it. And everybody's like, well, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. What are we doing? And there's this cynicism and nihilism and fear because people are more and more saying, I, I can't see us ever getting out of this. And that's because if we don't shift the basic consciousness of humanity, we aren't getting out of this. Yeah. And so yeah. Jesus is the name on a portal. But the Course says he's not, that's when you ask about what is the difference. The Course says he's not the only one. Mm -hmm. This particular path comes from him. And I think that if Jesus, if you feel that, then it's true for you. But that's not to say that the portal is not being provided for other people mm -hmm. in other ways, because mm -hmm. it is. And I think that's important. There's one truth spoken in many different ways. Um, and no one religion or, or tradition has a monopoly on truth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like to say the truth is one and the why is called by many names, mm -hmm. which is what you just said. It's from mm -hmm. the Rig Veda. Do you think it all revolves around love, though, quite simply? You become a loving being? Yes. Yes, but that's much easier said than done. Yeah, for sure. It is that simple. But once again, and then people, you know, it's not like we ever tried it. Yeah. <laughs> um, to actually live those words takes a lot of effort. And I think that we are all going through the experiences in our lives that are, with every encounter and every circumstance, both an invitation to choose love in our perception of each other and in how we behave and think, as well as challenging us to fall into ego default patterns of fear and lovelessness. And that's what's going on each and every minute of each and every day in everybody's life. Mm. And, you know, there's that idea of the tipping point, the hundredth monkey. The planet, we don't need the majority of the people of the world to wake up one day deeply committed to a better way. We need a critical mass. And I believe, this is how I look at it. You and I are having a conversation right now that I think it is reasonable to assume millions of people are having in their own way. 
yeah. through their own tradition, some in therapy, some in church, some in synagogue, some in mosque, some in Hawaiian spirituality, wherever, personal conversations, but it's going on. So we're living at a time when on one hand, you look out at the world and you go, oh my God, this thing's falling apart. Look at American politics. Look at where people are living. Look what's going on. You got the whole thing's just crumbling. And on one level, it is. But then simultaneously, there's something else going on. Simultaneously, people are getting it that we have to choose a better way. Mm -hmm. The Course in Miracles says the whole change begins when we consider the possibility there might be a better way. And that's what this book is about, but choosing a better way. Mm. And it's a race for time at this point. Mm -hmm. Time is of the essence. Time is of the essence because, you know, it's like the nuclear doomsday clock. We're closer than we've ever been to the yeah. point of global annihilation through nuclear bombs at any time since 1947. Um, and the environmental situation is so much more urgent than most of our um, elite leadership would have us believe. And mm -hmm. people's lives are falling apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. We are at this point that's like a seesaw, like a tipping point, it seems, a precipice of either utopia or dystopia. It seems you to know, be. I had an experience when I was young of uh, an assault. And when it happened, every cell, every cell became alive. Every cell became alive. And I had, and experiencing the reality of threat, I became smarter, wiser, stronger. And I think that's what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. I think that we have it within us to rise to the occasion. But we have to consciously and proactively surrender the childishness, the immaturity, the irresponsibility, the recklessness, the fear-based ways of thinking and being that have dominated our ways. And none of us are perfect at it. I mean, I think the great religious figure, Jesus, was. And the whole point of Jesus is the idea is that him having actualized that perfection of consciousness within himself, he's now authorized by God to help the rest of us. It's because we all have situations where We'd love to be more loving people, but the trigger, the wounds, the trauma, whatever it was, is too great. And, you know, the word religion means, uh, it comes from a Latin word, religio, which means to bind back. That's the purpose. You know, I love also in the Course of Miracles, it says religion and psychotherapy at their peak are the same thing, mm -hmm. the healing mm -hmm. of the mind. So we're we're all going through it. I don't know anybody for whom this is a really easy time. I don't know anybody. And everybody's affected by the larger picture of social media and politics and an election. Everybody's affected by that. Plus, we have our own individual circumstances where life is putting us through, where life is putting us through. Uh, it's like the universe is saying, come on, be big, be great, be strong. Mm -hmm. Come on. You can do yeah. it. Wise up. Wise up. Yeah. It's always darkest before the dawn, right? Yes, but we should be careful with that one. Because when it comes to the realm in which free will prevails, the dawn is not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it is. But that ultimately could be hundreds of thousands of years. I mean, that's like saying when people say, don't worry about the environment. It's, the earth is going to be okay, no matter what. Yeah, right. But that no matter what could take the form of throwing this predatory species called the human race 
off the planet for 200,000, 300,000 years while it heals. And that's not funny when you think about the human and other species scenario that would accompany that. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's to not get too lost in the darkness that is before the dawn as an excuse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that. That's quite powerful. Um, now, how do you say we even tap into this Christ consciousness? How does it start? What does it look like for all of us? I know it's well, hard to generalize, but if we could try well, to. Well, it's very specific, actually. There are specific practices. Uh, the Course in Miracles is a specific practice. But every religion, whether every, so first of all, every religion has its mystical element. Islam has Sufism, Judaism has the Kabbalah. I mean, all the religions. And then some people are doing this through mindfulness, through very secular contexts. If you want, if you say in your heart, I know what she's saying is true, but I don't know how to get there. If that's the prayer in your heart, books are going to fall at your feet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Be my book is going to be a, a thousand other books. But then there's the real practice. For instance, my book talks about A Course in Miracles. I, I will tell you this. I've never read a spiritual or uh, religious uh, tradition that does not emphasize the morning. Mm. Because when we wake up in the morning is when the mind is most open to new impressions. So if we immediately sort of surrender our minds to social media, the news, and all of that, it's very difficult to find our calm, to find our peace, to find our groundedness. But even five minutes in the morning, with whatever your practice will guarantee that your thought forms throughout the day will be influenced by that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how do we do it? You know, some people are listening to this right now and going, she's right. I do it. My life is much better. Some people are saying she's right. I should do it more. I'm not consistent. Sometimes when people with their meditation or their lessons from the course or whatever it is, I'll say, they'll say, They'll tell me that it works sometimes. They'll say, well, how often do you do the meditations? They'll say, well, sometimes. I say, well, then it works sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's like going to the gym. If you do it, it works. Mm -hmm. If you train your physical muscles, it works. And if you train your attitudinal muscles, it works as well. Truly. Mm -hmm. The thing is, you just have to do it in order to become a believer. You just have to do it. Yeah. There's only it's so much funny. we can say. It's amazing how much resistance we have sometimes to just sitting quietly with our eyes closed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the simplest, easiest thing to do in the world. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> and the hardest, the hardest, the hardest. Yeah. The ego mind doesn't like that. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a joke. But yeah, it is that simple. Be still and know. Truly. Yeah. Now, when we are in the stillness, when we find this um, just ultimate uh, awareness, whatever you want to call it, the Holy Spirit, do you feel as though there's intuitive guidance that we take into the goings on of our life, our Dharma, our work, that is something that just lets you know what you have to do? And that also, the guidance is not only just like for yourself and your life and the betterment of your life, but also in some way tied to the betterment of the world, your community, the people around you, right? Like tied to service? The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit is that intuitive guidance. Mm -hmm. And there's really only one of us here. So the universe, you might say, is win-win. <laughs> yeah. Yep. When I expand, by definition, it is service to the world because it expands, by definition, the possibilities that my influence and my relationship with others might be similarly positive. Mm -hmm. When we're healed, we're not healed alone. Mm -hmm. So that's why our seeking greater love in our own lives is a service to the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you feel as though once you tap in, there is no other way to conduct yourself, as in there is some kind of inclination or maybe obligation that is pulling you into love, into creating 
the kingdom of heaven? Well, the way you described it, it sounds like it would be easy. Uh, the problem is there's a gravitational pull of the soul towards love, but there's a gravitational pull on this earth of the ego away from love. Mm -hmm. So that's going on inside us all the time. Yeah. And just like there's physical gravity, there's emotional and psychological gravity. And if you're not working on keeping the muscles up physically, they're headed down. And if you're not working at keeping positivity up, negativity is pulling you down. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as a neutral thought. So that which is surrendered consciously, I surrender consciously, may this relationship be one of love. May this project be filled with love. May this circumstance be filled with love. The, the, pow the power of that is infinite. But if we do not consciously, proactively do that, the mind on its own will go towards pathology, neurosis, negativity, separation, anxiety, and fear. The emotions follow the thoughts. Hmm. So we have a tradition of analyzing the emotions. But that's like analyzing the darkness to get to the light. Yeah. When you turn on the light, the darkness disappears. Mm -hmm. The light is not hard. What's hard is getting over our resistance to doing it. Mm -hmm. You mean I'm supposed to pray for that person's happiness after what they did to me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so why is it worth it then, the path, right? If it because seems it's so the hard. God. Well, you know, the Course in Miracles says, do you prefer to be right or do you be happy? You can be right about all the terrible things and so much deserves to be judged and attacked, but you can't be happy. Mm. Inner peace comes from love. And in the presence of love, miracles occur naturally. If you don't, don't go being surprised at the anxiety, the fear, the depression, the weariness, the sickness, the... And and it's not like the person, you know, I just said the word sickness, so be careful. I'm not saying that the person who got sick got sick because they thought certain thoughts. But the whole society, just the way I'm, the world works, is making all of us sick. Yeah. It's the food we eat. It's the air we breathe. Disease. It's disease and dysfunction. And the thing about the ego, though, this belief that we're separate from each other and the things that this tempts us to do to foster that separation, to attack other people, to feel better than other people, to feel less than, whatever it is we do, it's leading us into this living hell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And everybody feels it. Everybody feels it. But I think that the, the, what's happening is how many people are going, what I said before, there has to be a better way, and are finding it. I mean, you see it everywhere. I mean, the very fact you do your podcast, it's what everybody's doing right now. Once again, we don't even need the majority of the people on the planet. We need a critical mass. So every time you have a podcast conversation, every time you write a book, every time you improve in your own life, every, we're all just leaning against the wall, leaning against the wall. And I think it's important to remember we're not alone. It's very easy to feel. I'm alone in this. It's just me. No, it's not just you. Everybody's going through this and everybody's hurting in this transition too. You know, it's like that Victor Hugo line. Remember that whenever you meet anyone, you are in the presence of a great war. I used to say at my lectures, think about the moment of your life that was the most painful. Just go back in your mind to the moment that was the most painful. And then I'd say, got that? And they say, yeah. Say, it is statistically, statistically reasonable for you to assume that the person to your right has suffered that much as well. It is statistically reasonable to assume that the person to your left has suffered like that and the person behind you and the person in front of you. We have no idea what people are going through. That's why my career has been so revelatory to me. You know? You're sitting and people come to you for counseling, right? Somebody walks into your room, they're this nice person. And then you hear of the pain that people are going through. When you really have deep conversations, right? 
So I think we all need more mercy for one another, more mercy for ourselves. Just remember, everybody's everybody's going through it. And uh, if we can ourselves just do what we can. But I also think, even with what I said, to be more merciful, that doesn't mean, however, that we should stay stuck in this, are you okay? Are you okay? What trauma are you working on today? We need to get in the habit of saying to one another, what great thing are you doing today? How can I help you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a revelation that comes with that God is love is that everyone is suffering. Maybe actually God is love comes from the revelation of everyone is suffering. I've felt that before and it's so it's painful, but when you feel it, it's like there's no other option than to approach everyone with love. If you can truly see somebody else's suffering in their eyes, even if you don't know exactly what they went through, but just like you said, know that most likely somebody has gone through something or they will go through something. It provides context to this whole thing we're talking about here with love and, and seeing love in each other's eyes and God in everyone else. It's, um, it's, I think you have to kind of recognize that even the people you don't like, like you said, you got to forgive your enemies. It might not be easy. That's actually probably the toughest part is to forgive it's the ones process. you don't want to forgive. Yeah. It's definitely it's a, a process. process. And you don't have to have lunch with them. Yeah. Yeah. But truly, we're all going through it. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Well, wow, this is powerful. I mean, uh, it all starts right now, though, right? We talk about it's a process and it's not easy. It's, um, it's it's a it's a tough journey, we could say, but it's quite simple to turn that all around. The atonement is right here, right now always it's always right here right now and it's the choice of fear or love you want to approach this situation out of fear competition separation or out of love knowing that like you said truly there's only one of us here when you look into somebody else's eyes you know that it's just you looking at you easier said than done for sure <laughs> but that's the essence of it at least how I see it. And every moment we're making that choice. Mm -hmm. We're either making it consciously or we're making it unconsciously, but we're making the choice. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's the choice. Yeah. That's the miracle, right? Is that the essence of A Course in Miracles is yeah. that choice? Yeah. yeah. That nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. If it's love, it's what's real. Mm. If it's not love, it's the... The manifestations our lovelessness has have come up with, and we can choose again. Mm -hmm. Choose love now. Choose love now. Well, hey, Marianne, I think that's an awesome note to wrap it up at. I appreciate you coming on here. Thank you. It was great talking to you. For sure. This went by like this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Lovely talking to you. I hope we meet again. Do you have anything much else love. you want to say? You just want to wrap it up? No, I think that was fine. Thank you so much. And I'm sure right. you're writing down at the bottom what the website is or something about yep. the book or whatever. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Thank you so much. Lovely talking to you, Gary. You as well. Have a good day. Thank you. Talk have to you later. Day. Bye. Bye.